forget. <laughs> so, and then it poured rain. Did, did it pour rain at anybody else's house or just mine? Okay. It turned green, and I was like, oh, that's, a, that's usually tornadoes. So, <laughs> which it didn't, so that was good. All right, well, let's pray, and we'll get started tonight. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your word, Lord, the privilege to study it, uh, to see uh, more of you in the Gospels, see Christ and his life and ministry, uh, see his character and the things that you've decided to emphasize about him for us. We ask that you'd help us to clearly understand uh, the purpose of the Gospel writers as they present the good news of Christ and, and try to emphasize different things about him for us. Uh, help us as we study your word in those passages, but also help us just to grasp um, just things about them that maybe we haven't understood before. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, we've dealt with Old Testament. We've dealt with biblical poetry. We've dealt with prophecy. And now we are on a New Testament historical narrative, which is similar to Old Testament historical narrative, but a little bit different. Uh, because like I mentioned, I think the end of last week, I said that um, all the writers of the Bible, they write in the, the genres of their time, right? Uh, so when people are writing history, it's not like history books today where we have just a bunch of facts and a bunch of dates and a bunch of things. Um, that's not the purpose of their history. The purpose of their history is usually to convey a message about God, uh, a message about what God has done for them and their culture and their people. And when you get to the Gospels, it's really no different. Uh, a lot of the historical writers, when you get to uh, the Greco-Roman era, are starting to write history as more factual. Before that, it wasn't really common to write factual history, um, which is why one of the reasons that we still have to defend the Bible as being factually accurate, because in the time period when those things were written, it was normal to just kind of lie about stuff to make your culture look good uh, or to make your false god look good. And so when you get to the Greco-Roman era, you start to see this emphasis on accurate history. Um, and so uh, that'll be important for us as we go through this, because there are people today that still attack the Gospels. If you listen to a normal atheist, or uh, I know we don't live in a very atheistic area, uh, but over time, even our area will become more and more atheist. That's just the nature of our culture. Uh, but it's important for us to understand why we can trust the Gospels, why we can trust what they say and what they record. Because you go to any secular university and they talk about the Gospels for five seconds, they're going to say that it's just a bunch of mythology, uh, which isn't true. So as we get into what we're talking about tonight, obviously we're talking about New Testament historical narratives. So this would include the Gospels and the Book of Acts. Those are the main history books of of uh, the early church, and Luke obviously writes Luke and Acts, and Luke actually is a very, very detailed historian compared to the other ones. I know that we look at Luke for his uh, being a physician, but actually out of all the gospel writers, he usually gives a lot of details. He cares a lot about the history and the facts and the order and all those things, which we've even seen that on Sunday afternoons. And so again, it is historical narrative. They're trying to convey a history of what happened, whether it's with the Lord Jesus, whether it's with the early church. And so as we look at the nature anyways of the gospels themselves, uh, the, the term gospel, which most of you understand, it means good news. Uh, the difference is good news, at least when it comes to gospel, isn't something you'd usually write down. It's something you'd usually say, uh, which makes the gospels very interesting because they wrote down what they wanted to say and they sent it to everyone as, as fast as they could. And in fact, there's plenty of evidence that the early church was very um, careful and very um, fervent in trying to get the gospel books as far as they could, as fast as they could. And so as they had money to do so, they would write those things and send those things out uh, because writing was very expensive then. And so they would try to get these things around, but really the gospels weren't really for the lost. They were actually for the church, right? It was for the church to increase their faith, to increase their knowledge of, uh, of the Lord Jesus, so they could live their lives after him. And so, again, when you see these gospel books, uh, that's why you won't find them trying to necessarily argue um, towards lost people. It's actually trying to give the reader, as a Christian, more information about who Christ is, so they can argue for who Christ is to lost people. So all four gospels, they share similarities, right, since they focus on the earthly life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. And so since they share similarities, often people will accuse the gospel writers of of you know, borrowing from something or not having a genuine record or things like that. As we go on here, we'll see that those claims are pretty false. Uh, but when it comes to their record, you should expect similarities, right? They're all giving eyewitness accounts of events. And even 
if I preached on Sunday morning, uh, you would all say that I said something different. <laughs> it's just the nature of it, right? When you hear something yourself, you each walk away with something different. Even though I, I know what I said, uh, but you each take it differently. And if everyone asked, what did Pastor Josh say on Sunday morning, you'd all have a slightly different take on it because you're eyewitnesses. And that's the thing, thing that's true in the Gospels as well, is you'll see all the Gospel writers will have just a slight nuance on what they're portraying Jesus said. And they're not inconsistent. Uh, they don't contradict each other. It's just a nuance of what they're trying to emphasize. So that's kind of how the Gospels work. When it comes to the genre of the Gospels, they're primarily uh, written in what's called Greco-Roman biography. Again, the Gospel writers write in their day and age. They write in their culture. And so Greco-Roman biography was something that had started about 100, 200 years earlier, and they were beginning to record historical narrative and beginning to record these things, and they would often focus on a hero character and, and try to present this person as this, this great person through their works, through their acts, through their deeds, through their sayings. And what you'll find, though, is that in Greco-Roman biography, um, they would still often make things up, right? You'll, if you, even if you read Greco-Roman biographies today, you'll see speeches in there, won't you? Uh, some of those speeches are made up. <laughs> because they're trying to just show how great this person is. The difference between Greco-Roman biography and the Gospels is what the Gospels say is actually true. Right? They're not mythologizing Jesus. They're not trying to make Jesus someone he's not. Uh, these are eyewitness accounts. Even when it comes to his resurrection, again, these things happen so early, it's not that they're trying to mythologize or make something up. Uh, they're saying something that's completely true. So this idea of it being Greco-Roman biography was actually accepted until about 1923. And then once modernism and postmodernism started rearing their heads, people started to kind of argue against the Gospels and argue against their history and uh, just, unfortunately, evil men doing evil things and maybe you could say ignorant men doing ignorant things. And so as a result of that, until then, that was the accepted view. And then for probably about 80 or 90 years, people start arguing against that to the point where Christians even kind of go away from the idea that it's Greco-Roman biography and say, well, it's its own genre called Gospels. That's not how genre works, okay? Uh, genre is what genre is. And so probably in the past 20 years or so, this has now become more accepted because that's, it's just what it is. When you compare stuff to Greco-Roman writing, it's, it matches up. Right? All the styles and everything matches up to what it is. And it's meant to give an accurate record. So um, others have suggested that these, again, when they're trying to argue against it, that, well, it's just the memoirs of the apostles, right? They're just musing. They're just whatever. Uh, that's not true. Again, it's not about the apostles in the story. They're not the figures that are of focus. Jesus is. Um, they'll call them, uh, right, eritologies, which is the idea of it's just a string of I am statements, which you see those in the book of John, right? I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. And so it's always just these I am statements. Well, that's not true either, because one, it really only applies to the book of John. <laughs> Nowhere else do you see Jesus with a bunch of I am statements. Um, it's just a comedy, which, by the way, comedy back then is not like comedy today. Right? Comedy today is meant to make you laugh. Comedy back then, right, it's a story that ends with a happy ending. Well, it's not a, it, that's not its purpose. It's not just to be a story that has a happy ending. Well, then others will say, well, it's a tragedy, right, because Jesus dies at the end. And so it's a story with a sad ending. Well, that's not true either because Jesus rises from the dead. So, uh, right, all these inconsistencies. Or it's a theological biography, right? Oh, it's just meant to, to just say these things about just the character of God, which isn't really true. It's trying to tell you about the person of Jesus Christ, right? It's a very focused thing, right? It doesn't have any ulterior motive besides to say who Jesus is. So, uh, like I said, today, the Greco-Roman biography views is, is what's generally accepted amongst conservatives. Uh, it includes, as well, um, similarities, such as a formal preface. So you'll actually see this in Luke. Uh, Luke will give a formal preface. For example, he says, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having also had, uh, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order, right? In the order of events from beginning to end. Most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty, certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So he gives a preface to his whole biography, saying, this is why I wrote this to you. Same thing in the book of Acts, right? He references it, Luke does, because Luke writes Acts as well, right? The former treatise, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And so then he's going to go into another kind of historical narrative, right, with these prefaces. 
So it includes a preface. Uh, it gives emphasis on an important individual, which obviously, in the context of the Gospels, is the Lord Jesus Christ. It establishes the individual through his deeds and activities. So you'll see all throughout the Gospels, why should I trust Jesus? And it'll give acts and signs and wonders and things that he does, things that he says as to why you should listen to him, why he's such a uh, person of authority and person who is truly the Son of God, right? He's going to establish his character, and then it's going to vindicate that character at some point in the story, which the vindication for the Jesus is his resurrection. And they go through all of this accusing Jesus, saying he's a blasphemer, saying that he's uh, got a demon, saying he's got all these bad things about him. And of course, Jesus prophesies and says, right, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll build it again. And of course, the vindication for Jesus is his resurrection to show everything he said was true. And so again, you'll see these styles as well. Uh, the main difference between those biographies, of course, uh, meaning Greco-Roman and the Gospels, is that there is no mythology in the Gospels. Right? Everything contained in the Gospels is true. There are no made-up stories. The miracles of Jesus are actual miracles. Uh, the prophecies of Jesus are actual prophecies. Everything that Jesus says is true. And again, when you read Greco-Roman uh, biographies, that's not true. Again, it'll make up speeches. Do you realize that Christians nowadays against atheists have to defend the fact that the things that Jesus says are actually the things that Jesus says? Or the sayings and speeches in the book of Acts are actually true and not just made up by Luke? Uh, and again, one of, the, one of the things for Luke that gives him a, uh, a defense against those accusations is he makes very clear, I interviewed these people and I'm telling you what they said. <laughs> right? So he makes very clear, I'm not just making this up. Uh, which is unusual for that time period, to be so staunch about the things that I'm saying are accurate, the things that I'm saying are true, right? I've interviewed people as to these things. Um, and so again, that's what makes the Gospels unique. And so yes, it, it's after that style, but it's still unique because everything it says is true. So we can trust the Gospels because it's by eyewitnesses. Again, when you read other Greco-Roman biographies, usually it's not eyewitnesses. In fact, they rarely ever interviewed anyone. They're just telling a story of the individual. Even today, you can read a biography on Abraham Lincoln. You can read a biography on Ulysses S. Grant, maybe Robert E. Lee, whoever you want to read a biography on. Uh, those aren't written by eyewitnesses, right? It's someone coming along later and writing these stories. And some of the stories, we don't even know if they're true or not. Uh, for example, right, George Washington, right, writing in the French and Indian War and having bullet holes through all of his clothes and all these things happening and yet somehow surviving. No one actually knows that that story is true. But if you read a history book, it's in there. You know why? Because it kind of makes George Washington look like this hero figure, doesn't it? Uh, the same with, right, uh, George Washington never telling a lie, right? And he chops down the cherry tree, all those things, right? No one knows if that story's true, uh, but they'll tell these things in history books and biographies because, right, it makes him look good. Again, we still today kind of act that way when we write. However, the difference is, is everything that's said about Jesus is true because it's written by eyewitnesses or close um, acquaintances of eyewitnesses such as, again, Mark and um, Luke. So when we see um, these things, again, uh, as, we, as we go along here, second, the Gospels do not simply report facts. Right? They carefully uh, selected and arranged material to most effectively, effectively convey God's message. I hope you understand the Gospels don't record everything about Jesus' life. In fact, one of the most frustrating things in the Gospels is basically you have an 18-year break from when Jesus was in the temple as a child to when he's an adult getting baptized. And you're like, hey, wait, what happened in that time frame? Well, guess what? It doesn't matter because that's not the point. The point of the Gospels is for you to clearly see the message that they have concerning the Lord Jesus. So they leave out details on purpose. Which nowadays you look at that and say, how could you leave out details? Well, because if you're just there to give details, you're really not conveying a message about someone's life. You're just giving details. Again, they're conveying details to try to emphasize something about who Jesus is. And so they'll emphasize things about his character. They'll emphasize things about his deity, about his miracles, about his message, because they're trying to show clearly who Jesus is. So even John says this, right? He says, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. And he goes on to say, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So John writes his gospel, so what? So people might have confidence in what? Jesus Christ. 
And again, the gospel writers are writing to believers. Why does John write his gospel? Because he's writing to believers who are probably starting to be under persecution. And so it gives them confidence to maintain their testimony, to maintain their faith, because this is who Jesus is, right? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so what? Believe in his name, have life through his name because of who Jesus is. And so again, as you see the different gospel writers, you'll see that Matthew presents Jesus as the promised king. That's why you'll see all throughout the book of Matthew phrases such as, and so it was fulfilled by such and such prophet, right? As it is written, he'll go through the prophecy. Uh, again, you'll see things like that. You'll also see Mark. Mark will present Jesus as a suffering servant because Mark has probably written to Roman Christians who are being persecuted. Again, each gospel has a, a Christian audience. And so as they're being persecuted, guess what? Uh, the first half of the book of Mark's all about discipleship, right? If you're going to be my disciple, you're going to follow me, and the second half of the book is about what? Well, Jesus' suffering. So guess what? If you're a Christian, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to suffer. And so the book of Mark, as it ends, its whole emphasis is on, well, here's how you suffer. Here's how Christ suffered. So here's how you should suffer. And he begins that difference right around, I think it's Mark 8 or 9, right when he says and gives his prophecy about, right, I'm going to be delivered over to the chief priests and, and these people, and they're going to kill me in three days, I'll rise again. And then from that point on, you see, again, the suffering of Jesus all throughout the book, because he's just finished saying, if any man come after me, he let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, right? Because the one that will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall find it. And so he's going to emphasize that right before he basically says, I'm going to die. So if you're going to follow me, what's going to happen to you? You might die too. And again, it's the Christians to what? Suffer well. Know how to suffer well. And so it presents Jesus as the suffering one because Christians suffer too. Again, each gospel has a different emphasis about the character of Jesus. It's not portraying four different Jesuses. It's portraying a different aspect of the Lord Jesus. When you get to Mark, or the book of Luke, right? We just finished the book of Luke on Sunday, right? Luke presents Jesus as the son of man. Again, it's not really his humanity, it's his messiahship, right? He's the divine messiah that's come, which is why all throughout the book of Luke, constantly the disciples ask, is now the time for the kingdom? In fact, the same author, when he gets to the book of Acts, because Luke writes Acts, that's the first question they ask before Jesus ascends, right? Is it, is it time to restore the kingdom to, to Israel? And he says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, but the Father alone. And then, of course, he ascends into heaven, and then the angels have to come to the disciples and say, hey, go back to Jerusalem and do what Jesus said, because they're just standing there. And so again, it presents Jesus as the coming king, the coming Messiah, and they have to realize that's a later event. That's something to hope for. And then, of course, John presents Jesus as the Son of God, right? He is the one that has come. He's the one that we should listen to. He's the one that has authority. Again, you kind of see that reiterated in Hebrews, right? He's, God used to speak by the prophets, but now in these last days, he's spoken to us by his dear Son, right? And that's why John focuses so much on Jesus' words. Why? Because the Lord has something to say, and he has something to be heard. And so again, that's why you'll see those things in John. Uh, third, like I said, the Gospels quote and allude to the Old Testament numerous times to indicate the fulfillment of prophecy. Matthew does this the most, although the other ones will as well, because again, it's not like the Gospel writers just have one purpose. I mean, they have a main theme, but they still have to prove who Jesus is and why he's come. And so, uh, for example, in Isaiah 7, obviously it's mentioned, right? The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then Matthew, Matthew reiterates this. Now, all this was done, right, about Mary being visited by the angel, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Because again, you'll also find that Matthew will often interpret what he's saying, because he's not just writing to Jewish Christians, which is funny when people say, oh, Matthew's audience is Jewish Christians. Then why would he have to say what it meant? Because you'll often find he'll do that. He'll say, this means this, or this in the Hebrew tongue is this, or this in Aramaic is this. Why would you do that if your audience is just Jewish? They would know what you're saying. So obviously the Gospels are meant to be read very widely. Otherwise, you wouldn't care if your audience was just Jewish Christians. For example, if I went and sat in a seminary lecture, guess what? They're not going to say, this means this, this means this, this means this, this means this, because they assume I already know what it means. But... If a seminary teacher came and taught in church, hopefully they would have enough wherewithal to understand. You're going to have to explain some things because not everyone in your audience is going to know what you're saying. Uh, that's why on Sunday mornings, right, usually you have to uh, bring the food to the bottom shelf. Why? Because you're dealing with people who might not know. Now, hopefully you have 
again, food that's full enough that everyone, even though it's at the bottom shelf, they enjoy the meal. But by the same token, you have to bring where people are at. Otherwise, they won't understand what you're saying. So again, Matthew does that because Matthew wants to convey, uh, again, who Jesus is. The Gospels include modes of narrative similar to Old Testament narrative. So you'll have reporting of events. You'll have right, drama right, with, with, with people speaking. You'll have just description. You'll have commentary. So an example of this is that the account of uh, Jesus' birth, you have both a setting and a narrative. Why? Because again, these are narrative accounts. They're written in stories. They're, they're written in a way to, to, to give you clues and hints about what you're to be looking for in individuals. Um, what's kind of setting up uh, suspense, which I understand. It's, it's, it's kind of sad for us. Sometimes we read the Bible like we've always read it, and none of the suspense we're supposed to feel, we feel anymore. Um, for example, we went through the book of Ruth on Friday, and there's a lot of suspense in that book if you read it. And you wait, and it's like, oh, what's going to happen to Ruth? Is she going to get married? Is she going to be stuck? What's going to happen? I mean, Boaz just refused her proposal. What's going to happen? Again, it's just a good, good, good old Hallmark movie if you read it. I mean, it really is. I mean, every Hallmark movie is based off the book of Ruth. I'm serious, right? You have this, this poor lady that all these bad things have happened to her, and then she finds her hero man, and he treats her so well and so good, and then something bad happens where, oh, no, maybe we can't get married. Maybe it won't work out. And then it works out in the end. It's like, oh, okay, that's good. Right? And it's always set in four acts like that. That's every Hallmark movie ever. It's the book of Ruth. So again, uh, some of this is meant to clue you into who people are, clue you into to what you're kind of supposed to be expecting, and then sometimes it flips your expectation on its head. Oh, I didn't expect that to happen. Right? Judas isn't really presented as one that you're really expected to see as a betrayer, except one, I think one or two of the gospel writers kind of say it up front. But the other gospel writers don't even say it. It's kind of Judas, really? Like, one of the disciples are going to do this? Because they don't even mention it until the Last Supper, that, hey, someone's going to betray him. And so, again, sometimes that's supposed to be unexpected. Like, oh, I didn't expect that to happen. Uh, And again, sometimes it's lost on us because we grew up in church. We hear these stories from a child that when we read the gospel accounts, it's like, oh, yeah, it's Judas. It's supposed to be a shocking thing, by the way, that it's Judas. Yeah, the disciples didn't know either, right? They're so ignorant of it because Judas holds the money. It'd be like buzzing off, going out and, right, shooting a Christian. <laughs> you'd be like, what is wrong, right? No one would expect that to buzz, but if that happened, you'd be like, what in the world has happened? Uh, it'd be so shocking. Uh, so, for example, when you get to this idea of setting a narrative, right, Matthew one eighteen kind of sets up a setting for the birth of Jesus, right? The birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, right? Here's how it happened. When as his mother Mary was espoused, to Joseph before they came together, again, before they're married, before they've consummated anything, she's a virgin, right? She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And then it's going to give a description in the narrative concerning a character. Then Joseph, her husband, what is he described as? A just man. So when you see Joseph, you're supposed to think throughout the whole book, Joseph is a righteous man. He's a just man. Everything he does is, is, is to the law and what he should be doing, which is why, again, they take Mary Right away, as soon as it's time to go be purified, they take Jesus as soon as it's time to go be dedicated because Joseph is one that follows what God says. And so even in his righteousness and his justice, what does he not want to do? Well, he doesn't want to make Mary, uh, he's not willing to make her a public example. He was minded to put her away or divorce her privately. Right? He didn't want her to be embarrassed. He didn't want her to be stoned to death. In fact, even in divorcing her, because he had to write to stone her, Even in divorcing her, he wanted to do it quietly so that way she wouldn't be besmirched or ashamed. By the way, if you're a just person, you should never want someone to be embarrassed publicly. And that's clearly what Joseph is described as. He's a just man. And when he has to do something that's hard, he doesn't do it publicly and say, hey, I guess you'll never believe what happened to me. He he was going to do it privately, basically never speak of it again. And what does God do? Well, he sends an angel and says, Joseph, you know, this is, this is from me. This is my doing. Just wait till she's had this child and, and then come together. Right? And that's what he does. And they have more children to the chagrin of many Catholics. Uh, sorry, I still see Catholics on Twitter defending uh, Jesus is the forever, or Jesus, Mary's the forever virgin. She had no other children. And it's like, oh, okay. Except the passage that literally say his brother and, and the names of the brothers and all those things. Uh, so, Again, uh, you have a setting, you have a description of a character, again, to, to, to get your attention. And so, by the way, when it gives a description like that, pay attention to what they do. This is what a just person does. This is what a righteous person does. 
uh, it's important. But it also shows, too, God puts Christ in the right family to what? To be taught God's word. Because, again, Jesus, even though he's God, limits himself when he's born. And what? He, is, he grows in favor with God and man, is what Luke says. He still grows up. So God makes sure to put them in the right family to where what? He's going to be taught God's word, to do what God says, to obey the law, and to do so when he doesn't even have the knowledge to make sure he's obeying. Like what? When he gets dedicated at 30 days. Again, you can't decide that. And if you don't do it, or to be circumcised the eighth day, if you're not circumcised, what happens to you? We were cut off from the covenant. Was that your choice, though? You're just a baby. No, you have to have parents who are what? Going to make sure that things happen the way they should happen. So God gives us those examples. Fifth, the Gospels, like Old Testament narratives, they also include dialogue to give a deeper understanding of characters involved. Understand when there's dialogue back and forth. I'm not just talking about Jesus' teachings. Right? You'll see dialogues in Luke and Matthew and John and Mark between the Pharisees and Jesus or between uh, his disciples and him. Why? Because it's helping you understand those that are there. Uh, for example, before we get to the example here, in Mark, Jesus and the disciples will often talk about and reference the feeding of the 5,000. Because seemingly... What happens there ends up hardening the disciples' hearts, and Jesus looks at them and says, are your hearts still hard from the feeding of the 5,000? And so he'll go back and forth with them there because apparently they felt embarrassed and were upset over what happened at the feeding because Jesus kind of makes them look stupid because of their lack of faith. Um, no, he doesn't do it publicly. I don't think he shouted, right? What do we have, right? He's, just, he's talking with them, but they obviously felt so hardened by what happened that they held on to it. And Jesus brings it up constantly. I think he brings it up two or three times in the book of Mark after the event. Also in the book of John, we see, again, a lot of dialogues between Jesus and the religious leaders. John 8, 48, the, the Jews answered him and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil? Right? So they basically, right, basically curse at him. I mean, that's the equivalent to, you know, calling someone bad names and the worst names that you can think of. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you, you do dishonor me. Right? Jesus is going to emphasize, right, what you're saying about me is false. I serve God, and I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and one that judgeth. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. So again, when you come to this, it shows the difference between Jesus and the religious leaders. Because he'll emphasize all throughout the book of John, they're in it for their glory, and he's in it for God's glory. But these dialogues show what? It shows the difference between the two. So that's why often when you'll hear me talk about the book of John, I'll say the book of John clearly shows that they crucified Jesus because of they wanted their position. Where do I get that idea from? Because the dialogues reveal that about their character. It shows all they cared about was having authority. All they cared about was preserving what was theirs. So even in the book of John, is recorded right when the high priest prophesies and says, you know, should not one die for the nation? And he prophesies, and of course he means it to preserve their authority, uh, but the Bible says the Holy Ghost spoke by him because he was the high priest that year, right? The Lord used him to prophesy and said that Jesus would die for the nation because that's what he does do. Uh, he dies for their sins, not just so they wouldn't be hurt by Rome. Uh, the origins of the gospel. So one of the questions that it's important to ask is why, why are there four gospels? Uh, why is it important that, that God just didn't just give us one gospel? Uh, because there seems to be a lot of argumentation if you ever talk with an atheist, if you ever talk with someone who doesn't believe in the Bible, or even supposed Christians nowadays, um, they will kind of argue against the Gospels and say, well, you know, they're all borrowing from things. They're all doing this. They're all doing that. They're not authentic. You know, why couldn't we just have one Gospel? By the way, if you just have one Gospel, they would still argue against it, okay? It doesn't change their argument. They don't want God's Word to be true. Uh, but the fact that there's four Gospels actually gives a lot of authenticity to what they say because it's not just one person's account of what happened. It's four person's account of what happened. So again, the first thing that we see here is each Gospel gives a unique theological perspective of Jesus. Right? We talked about, again, Jesus being the promised king. We talked about Jesus being the suffering servant, being the son of man, being the son of God. Right? They're each trying to convey their, their, the stories that they pick of Jesus' life to convey a certain idea, to convey a certain picture. And it's not that Jesus isn't the other things. It's just they're trying to emphasize that truth about his character in that moment. Because all of those things are true about him. It's just sometimes you emphasize one thing over another. You only have so much time to write. By the way, especially then. Writing's very expensive then. You think you're just going to take up all your writing by just saying every event possible? No, you're going to be very purposeful in what you pick to write down. Because the things that you write down cost a lot of money. In fact, even the book of Mark, which is the shortest gospel, I think they estimated it would cost, if you wrote it today, 
I think it was about $5,000 in today's money to write one copy of the Gospel of Mark. So again, you can see why you didn't write very often. And when you did write, you chose your words very carefully. Why? Because it's very expensive to, to do this thing. Uh, also, uh, by reading all four Gospels, we get a multifaceted picture of Jesus. Again, we can compare them and see a, a, a bigger picture. Right? So we see that Jesus isn't just one that suffered, like in Mark. We see that Jesus is a king whose purpose is not quite fulfilled yet in Luke. We see Jesus' position as God's son in the book of John. We see Jesus as this one that's been promised in the book of Matthew. In fact, Matthew picks his stories in a way that it kind of follows the Old Testament. Right? Jesus is, um, exam- for example, until they get to on a mountain, uh, everything that happens to Jesus kind of mimics Genesis through, De- through Deuteronomy. Uh, right? You have someone who is a promised one coming whose birth is announced. Uh, again, you sit with Isaac, the promised seed, whose birth is announced. Jesus is born of somewhere that should not have had life. Right? He comes from that. And then as well as you see as you go through, uh, you'll see Jesus in the wilderness. Right? Again, the people of Israel were in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus is there for 40 days. Right after he comes out of the wilderness, guess where he goes? He goes on a mountain. Uh, guess where Moses goes, right? He goes on a mountain, right? All of these things kind of mimic all throughout because, again, he's trying to so, show the people that Jesus is the fulfillment of what? All the prophets. That's the, kind of the key verse in Matthew, is what? Matthew five seventeen, right? Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy. I'm come to fulfill, right? And so what does he do? Well, God kind of orchestrates the events out in that book to show uh, that whole Old Testament really is a picture of Jesus' life. So everything Jesus does kind of correlates in order to the Old Testament. Now, given their Old Testament's a slightly different order after you get to Deuteronomy, right? Their Old Testament's going to go then Joshua through Kings without Ruth, and then all the prophets without Daniel, and then it's going to go to the poetry books, Daniel, Ruth, Nehemiah, Ezra, those books, and then Chronicles, which is the end of their books. Why? Because it's showing that picture, to show what? Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that's been said. And so again, even the way they convey their stories have significance. And so I say all that to say, when you read these books, you should be sitting down and thinking, okay, why is this here? Why do they say it this way? Again, the book of Luke, its purpose is not to right, have something like that. Its purpose is to set all the events in order. He says that in his preface, right? To, to give you the order of events. So if you want a chronological order of Jesus' life, go read the book of Luke. Because the other Gospels don't give you a chronological order necessarily. They're picking things in a way that shows the message they're conveying. Even in the book of Mark. The book of Mark um, will pick events to show Jesus' authority over demons, over sickness, and over basically all of creation. And so it does that in basically a two-chapter narrative because it's not that those events happen in that order. He's, He's trying to show in a moment, very quickly, look at Jesus' power. And so he picks right? Four or five events from Jesus' life that show this great significance of look at Jesus' power. Even though if you read Luke, you'll maybe find a different series of events. Also, um, when it comes to these multifaceted pictures, if, like I said, if you only read John, you might not think that Jesus taught parables or performed any sort of miracles against demons, because John doesn't record a single exorcism. And John, furthermore, doesn't record a single parable given by Jesus. So if you only read that, you'd probably think, oh, Jesus just had these sayings, and Jesus didn't do anything besides, you know, just do these kinds of miracles. No, Jesus did miracles against every single thing in creation. If you only read Mark, right, you'd have gaps in stories, because Mark gives very, very short, short versions of all the things that happened in Jesus' life, and they're all very quick, which is why you'll see this phrase, right, straight away they did this, which means immediately. Immediately they did this. Immediately they did that. And it's just constantly here and there and everywhere. Uh, because Marx kind of focuses to kind of get you to the end of the book. And uh, he's a guy that wants to, he, he'd be like the preacher that would come in and preach for 20 minutes, and you'll be like, this is the best. This is the best thing I've ever heard, because it was nice and succinct, right? And then you have guys like me who preach for an hour, hour and a half, and it's like the book of Matthew, and you're like, when is this guy going to finish and wrap up? We've heard the story at this point. And, uh, but everything has a purpose, obviously, depending on the author. Uh, furthermore, by having four Gospels, you also have four credible records from eyewitnesses. Again, whether the writers, because Matthew and John are actual eyewitnesses of those events. Again, Matthew's a disciple, John's a disciple. And they'll both give very detailed records. In fact, John gives the most unique of all the records. Or 
You also have ones that interviewed people, like Mark and Luke. Again, Mark seems, according to history, follows Peter. So Mark gets most of his records of Jesus from the apostle Peter. He records them down. Mark possibly was in the garden the night Jesus was betrayed, but Mark doesn't really know Jesus outside of possibly the last events of his life. Uh, other than that, he didn't go around like Peter did, so he gets most of his accounts from Peter. And then you also see, again, Luke. Luke is the disciple of Paul, right? In fact, Luke partners with Paul at the end of Acts. Luke never met Jesus, but what does Luke do? Well, Luke goes and interviews all the people that knew him because by the time Luke comes along, a lot of those people are still alive. And so he probably interviewed Mary. Why? Because he gives a very detailed account of the things that Mary was told, the things that happened to her, and the events and how the order they happened. I don't know if he interviewed the wise men or not, but someone obviously close in relation to those events, probably Mary, right, knew these things. That's why he'll say, she pondered these things in her heart. Right? Luke's the one that says those things. Why? Because he's giving a record of, from her perspective. Right? He knows what she's thinking, so he can comment on it. Uh, and so he does that with seemingly a lot of those that knew Jesus. He goes around and gives those records. Uh, when it comes to critical study of the Gospels, critical is usually a bad word when it comes to theology, okay? Uh, so there are people that will criticize and speak against uh, the Gospels. So, for example, one of the things that people will accuse the Gospels of is they're too similar. And since they're too similar, well, they must be all just borrowing from something, they're just making it up, all these things. Um, or they'll, later on, they'll even accuse um, of other things as well. So what you'll find is you'll find many similarities, right, in the Greek text, suggesting that the writers knew of each other's writings. Right? That doesn't that make sense, right? If, if Mark, depending on who wrote their gospel first, we don't actually know who wrote their gospel first, okay? People try to surmise and try to say, we don't really know. Uh, but some people will think Mark, some people will think Matthew, one of those two they think were likely written first. And then they'll go beyond that and say, well, they all must have borrowed from someone because they all have similarities. Well, doesn't it make sense that whoever wrote their gospel first, everybody else read it, and then someone else wrote from a different perspective concerning the character of Jesus and what they wanted to emphasize? So, of course, they would list similarities because they're using that narrative to show, yep, Jesus is this as well when it comes to what they're emphasizing. So Augustine, he suggested that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are similar based on their order of writing. And again, this is the view that's usually taken by conservatives, right? Again, they knew of each other's writing. They would have read each other's writing, and so they would have included different aspects of it and maybe different perspectives on it. Uh, because again, they know of each other. The liberal view, which I would not take, is that there's this random document out there that nobody knows about. By the way, you'll find with liberals, it's all hypothesis of things that nobody's ever discovered. That's the amazing thing. We're going to base our beliefs on things that nobody's ever discovered anywhere. So they'll say there's this random document called the Q document, or the this document, or this or that document. And so these documents were out there, and they found it, and they took the stories from it and made their own things. You know where they get that from? Their own heads. You know why? Because there's no evidence anywhere of any of these things they ever hypothesize. In fact, when we went through the Old Testament, we talked about in the Old Testament historical narrative that one of the arguments against liberals, against conservatives is, oh, well, in Genesis or Deuteronomy, you have, sometimes they'll call God Yahweh or Jehovah. Sometimes they'll call God Elohim. Sometimes they'll call God Shaddai. Sometimes they'll call God, you know, this or that. And so there must be different people that came along and redacted, and one of them must worship a God that was named Jehovah. Some of them must worship a God that was named Elohim. Some of them must, must worship a God that was named Shaddai. And they just came along years afterwards and corrected what they wanted to or added what they wanted to to fit their God. And that's what, by the way, liberals still believe that. You know, two years ago, they found on Mount Ebal, which is the Mount of Cursing, right? When they get to the Promised Land, they stand on Mount Ebal, they pronounce the curses. They stand on Mount Gerizim and pronounce the blessings. And they sacrifice on Mount Ebal, which, by the way, there's still an altar on Mount Ebal today that fits the dimensions the Bible said. Uh, two years ago, they discovered a big piece of lead there, which lead is not anything very impressive. They did a, a scan of it, and they found inside, they could actually read Hebrew text inside of this big block of lead. And inside of it, it had Elohim and Jehovah names right beside each other. And guess what it's dated to? The conquest. Oh, wow. Because that must mean that the Israelites in that day called God both Jehovah and Elohim, which means that their hypothesis is wrong. But guess what? It's still being taught in liberal universities. And their hypothesis is right, because who cares what's actually been discovered? We've made these things up in our head, and so we'll teach it as truth. 
again, you have to teach truth based on what's real. And what's real is we have four gospel accounts. Uh, we don't have some random document over here. We've never found it. We've never discovered it. It's not real. But what is real is the gospel accounts. And I can prove they're real because John, which is most people assume to be the latest written gospel, actually has the earliest extant manuscript of any writing of the New Testament. Extant means it's still in existence, okay? I'm sorry I use big words sometimes. These are good for you to know because you'll read it sometimes. So extant means this, this document's still with us. And the, the portion of the Gospel of John is dated to about 110, 120 AD. Right? So the earliest record is written, is, is written after between 30 to 50 years from when that Gospel is written. By the way, the, the next closest thing we have of any writing in antiquity is about, especially when it comes to that period of Greco-Roman writing, it's about 1,000 years. And liberals will look at the Bible and say, it's full of errors. It has all these issues. There is no other writing in history that has such early attestation than the Word of God. There's just not. Especially the gospel accounts. Why? Because the gospels are the the first things you find, which means their whole Q document thing is a bunch of hogwash. So if you ever hear a liberal say things, just understand they're making things up in their minds so they don't have to believe in God. Second, in viewing the Gospels, it's good for us to compare them to see the different details they add. Because right? some Gospels will say something, another Gospel won't. So again, understand each Gospel writer is trying to emphasize something about Jesus, but sometimes it is good if you find a narrative in all of them to compare them. So I've given you a synthesis, the feeding of the 5,000. I did this when I was in seminary, probably seven years ago. And so one of my assignments in class, in fact, there's actually a typo in the back. One of my colors is wrong, and it's probably from the book of Mark. And so you'll notice that what I did is I made a key. I chose a gospel to use. So Mark's the main gospel I chose, right? That's seen from the very first line. I made each gospel a different color and a different font. Why? So I could read through the narrative of the feeding of the 5,000 and see what's different, what's the same. And so I didn't obviously copy and paste all of them. What I did is I took one, Mark was the main one I used, and any other gospel that added a detail, I added it where it fit with the other gospels. And so what you find is you'll find details that you might not find in the book of Mark. For example, uh, right, you see in the apostles, when they returned, because Mark doesn't mention anything about their return. So what are they returning from? Well, they're returning from preaching in the cities. So Luke mentions the aspect that they returned. In fact, because Luke mentions the aspect they went out as a whole group, gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship priv- privately. And so um, John mentions, right, what they're going at, right? He says, over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Because, again, you could think, well, maybe it's the Dead Sea. So John clarifies and says, oh, it's the Sea of Galilee. Then Luke clarifies, and he took them, right? Went aside privately into a desert place. John adds, this desert place was a mountain, right? So it's not just a flat desert place. It's a mountainous desert place. And Luke adds, belonging to the city of Bethsaida. So where is this desert place a part of? Well, it's part of where Bethsaida is. Right? By the way, Bethsaida is one of the cities that Jesus speaks against because they reject him. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and out went them and came together unto him. Right, Because Jesus is on a boat, and they're running on the land trying to catch him. And they came together unto him, and this is what John adds, because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Because Jesus had just finished healing a lot of people. And so they're chasing after him. Why? Because of his miracles. If you just read Mark, you wouldn't really know why they're running after him. Besides, well, maybe he's just a good teacher. No, they're running after him, according to John, because of what he does, which is John's big emphasis, right? It doesn't matter so much what Jesus does. What did he say? And by the way, what he does emphasizes what he said. That's what Hebrews says too, by the way. Hebrews 2 will emphasize that God performed signs and wonders so they would listen to his word. Which, again, if stuff's already been authenticated, there's no more reasons for the signs and wonders. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And again, you'll see a lot of these in a lot of the Gospels. Matthew mentions the same thing. 
Uh, Luke, will say, or Luke will say because of that, he received them. Right? He doesn't just have compassion and do nothing. He right, receives them, says, Greg, come here. And then Matthew records, he healed their sick, which goes along with what John said, right? Why did, why did John say they ran to him? Because they saw that he could heal the sick. And then Matthew records that he healed their sick. So again, you can see how these Gospels, when you put them together and synthesize them, you can see all the details of what's going on. Why are they coming after Jesus? Why are they doing these things? And he began to teach them many things and spake unto them the kingdom of God. Because Mark just says that he just taught them many things. Luke will say what he taught them about. And when the day was now far spent, Matthew's going to give you the actual time. And was evening. His disciples, and Luke clarifies which disciples, the twelve. Right? It's not just all of them. It's the twelve. Came unto him and said, this is a desert place. And now the time is far past. Send them. Matthew clarifies to them as the multitudes, all those people, a way that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And Luke's going to clarify too, beyond that, and lodge and get fiddles, right? Fiddles are just supplies, for we are here in a desert place. So again, they're all adding what they should do. So it's not just to get food, it's they can stay there, as in they can leave us alone. Because that's really what the disciples want when you read the narratives. He answered and said unto them, they need not depart. And that's what Matthew adds. Mark just says, give you them to eat. So Matthew kind of adds on top of that to kind of clarify. They don't need to go anywhere. And he's going to say, because you're going to feed them. <laughs> and again, you can understand why in the book of Mark, they're like, what? What do you mean, Jesus? We can't feed them. And they say unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth? That's again, 200 days wages worth of bread and give them to eat. So again, imagine what you make in two-thirds of a year. That's what it would have cost to feed all these people. And then John records, he saith unto Philip. So now he's going to address specific disciples. Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him. By the way, notice he didn't say to prove them. He's testing Philip individually. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, right? 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. He saith unto them, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. And then, again, John records, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Because you'll find, again, the book of John does not actually record Jesus saying, go and find out. It just kind of records that Simon Peter brings the lad up. Well, Mark makes very clear, Jesus said, go and figure out what's going on. Go and, go and find um, these things. Go and see what we have. And when they say, Matthew records, we have here, and Luke, no more, but five, again, John's going to clarify what kind of loaves, barley loaves, and two, John's going to add small fishes. Because when you read Mark, it's just five loaves and two fishes. Again, when you read John, he adds kind of the insignificance of them. <laughs> these are very small things. This is nothing to brag home about. Luke will clarify, except we should go buy meat or food for all this people, for they were about 5,000 men. Matthew records, he said, bring them hither to me. Right? So he's still not sending them away. Again, Matthew keeps recording. He's not sending them away right? because Matthew's going to keep emphasizing he's the shepherd of compassion. Right? They're as sheep which have no shepherd. So Jesus is going to keep saying, keep bringing them to me. Don't send them away. I'm their shepherd. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass and when they sat down in ranks by hundreds and fifties, and when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed them and break the loaves and gave them to all his disciples, or gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And then John says, as much as they would, right? John's going to clarify everyone ate all that they wanted. And they did all eat and were filled. John records, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Because Mark's just going to say, they took up 12 baskets full. Uh, John's going to clarify kind of why they were so upset, because Jesus makes them gather it. And when they gather it, guess what they find? They find a basket for each of them. And so each of the 12, who are the focus of the story and their unbelief, because all the people believe, right? He can heal our sick. And the 12 that are there that should believe, because they've just seen God do all these amazing things, are the ones that don't believe. And then what happens? Well, they get to carry the 12 baskets themselves. Which would kind of, again, it's kind of when your parent kind of rubs your face in it after you don't listen. 
And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments. Matthew says that remained of the five barley loaves and of the fishes. Again, John says, which had remained over and above unto them that had eaten. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. And Matthew is the one that records beside women and children. And then John finishes it with, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Why? Because John's focus is, listen to his words. So he gives that detail at the end, right? This made them want to hear what he had to say. Why? Because now he's a prophet. Because he's done this miracle. So again, when you compare them, you see a fuller picture of what's going on. Right? You can see that Philip's probably mad, and, and Simon or Andrew's kind of probably frustrated. Why? Because they're the ones that are kind of singled out as the ones that are arguing as to why this is impossible. And their frustration seems to spread to all the other disciples when you read the rest of the account of Mark. Because Jesus is going to constantly bring up, why are your hearts hard? Why are you still upset about this? Uh, Because again, you'll see, even based on when you see what John said and what Mark said, it's like Jesus said, okay, go each of you take a basket and fill it up, what's left over, and they each had a basket full and they had to carry it to kind of rub their face in it. Why didn't you just trust God? Because all those people who were as sheep having no shepherd trusted me, why aren't you trusting me? Isn't that ironic with Christians though, by the way? That it seems like unbelievers who know nothing about God sometimes trust God more than we do. And we've seen God work again and again and again and again and again. And so what? The things that we've already seen God do should encourage us to trust him for the impossible things that are now here. Because what? Nothing is impossible with God. And when God does what he does, what does it make people do? Again, what John records, it makes them believe in Jesus. And wouldn't it have been easier to not be rebuked by Jesus and instead believe with them? Why? So we could all believe together (laughs) instead of having to have been taught a lesson. Because again, Jesus said those things to what? To test Philip. What's Philip going to do? And by the way, Philip failed the test. (laughs) Because Philip should have said, surely, Lord, you can do this but he doesn't. Instead, they harden their hearts. By the way, don't let your failed trials harden your heart. You know why? Because sometimes we fail trials, but they shouldn't make us hate God. In fact, really, they should make us think, well, why didn't I trust him in the first place? That was really silly. So again, these are things, when you see accounts all over all the other gospels, again, this is what Bible study is. What? To take the time to actually sit down Again, kind of paste maybe the longest account and look at all the accounts. If it's in three Gospels, sometimes it's in four. Again, the feeding of the 5,000 is one of four events or one of three events. can't remember which one. Well, it's in the notes somewhere. One of so many events that's in all four. Which means what? When I see it, I should compare them. Because it's in all four. This is a big event. Again, usually the synoptics, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are the ones that record the same events. When John adds it, that's really significant. Okay, what, why is this here? But even when it's just Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what should I do? I should compare it. Even if it's just two Gospels, I should compare it. Why? Because it's going to give you a fuller picture of what's going on. Now, don't let that devalue what the author of that Gospel is trying to emphasize about Jesus. Uh, because each of them put things in their Gospels to emphasize certain things about who Jesus is. Whether it's that he's the one that fulfills promises, whether it's he's the one that's the suffering servant, whether he's, again, the son of man, the one who's going to come as king, and whether or not he's the son of God. When it comes to John and the synoptics, again, you have these different gospels. Right? The synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Right? It comes from uh, two words. Right? Optic means what? To see. Right? And, and sin is the Greek word soon, which means with, together. Are the Gospels that are together? The Gospels that say the same things, the see the, that see the same things. So it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they're going to record a lot of the same events. By the way, if Jesus lived life and there were significant events, don't you think a lot of people would say the same significant things? Sure. Same reason you, in your life, even if you're married, you probably, if you're married, you and your spouse probably share the same significant events. And if you listen off the significant events in your life, you probably mention the same things. You'd mention when you met, you'd mention when you got married, you'd mention when you had your, all your children, and when what? When, when they got married, and when they had children, and what their degrees were. Why? Because that's what's significant to you, even though you saw it with what? The same eyes. And you're going to mention what? Similar things. Even though every now and then you might mention something slightly different, because something else stood out to you here, something else stood out to you there. But you're going to mention all along the way basically the same things, because those were the significant things. 
Uh, second, there are only a few accounts that the synoptics and John have in common, including fitting of the 5,000, the anointing of Jesus, and the passion events, right? The passion events is the Last Supper, um, right? That, that week that leads into that, as well as his crucifixion and resurrection. John has many accounts unique to himself, and again, that should not be surprising because he's the one that's closest with Jesus. So there'll be certain events that John's going to see that the others are not going to see. There's certain things that he's probably going to notice when he hears them that others won't. Because again, if he's the closest, it makes sense that the words of Jesus probably matter to him more than anybody else. Why? Because he kind of hangs on every word that Jesus says. He's so enraptured by it. Right? He's the one that when Jesus talks, the Bible says he, right, he kind of hangs on his chest. He's kind of right there to listen. Right? Because he cares so much about what Jesus says. So it shouldn't be surprising that he spends most of his time talking about what Jesus says. And furthermore, that he has a different perspective about what's important. He doesn't view all the miracles, even though he's going to mention a lot of them, as important. He's going to view them as important when it comes in relation to what Jesus actually says. So in John 21, 20, again, to emphasize that John's the closest, right? Then Peter, turning about, see at the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? That's John following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee, right? He's going to emphasize this is the disciple that's closest with Jesus. Again, did Jesus love all of his disciples? Yes. Again, God loves the whole world. But that just because you love people doesn't mean there's not people you're closer to than others. Uh, for example, Abraham is called the what of God? The friend of God. Yeah, he's the only one in the Bible who's called the friend of God. Why? Because some people are closer to God than others. Again, it's a relational thing. Is everyone that's in Christ a child and son of God? Yes. But are there some people that are closer to the Lord than others? Yes. Right? Relationship does not constitute closeness. Uh, but all of us should want to be like John and be close to the Lord. Why? Because because God is spirit, we can all be close to him. It's not like he's far away. In fact, the Bible emphasizes repeatedly he's near. Uh, furthermore, we see examples of what's unique to John, including uh, the story of Nicodemus in John 3, the Samaritan woman in John 4. Uh, you have what's called the farewell discourse in John 13 through 17. And you also have several signs, including the raising of Lazarus, right? Those are all unique to John. By the farewell discourse is the only place that's really talked about the Holy Spirit. Um, other gospels record when Jesus, before he descend, ascends into heaven, he'll say, right, receive the Holy Ghost, and he breathes on them. Well, the place where he actually talked about the Holy Ghost is in the book of John, because John's going to emphasize that so much, because the Holy Spirit's now come. And so who is this comforter? Well, he's someone that Christ has prophesied that would come. Uh, John also likely writes his gospel independently of the other three, even though he knows of their existence. Again, he's emphasizing different things. He's not going to pick the same things that happen with Jesus because, again, not to say that John didn't care, but those aren't the significant things to emphasize that he's the Son of God. Fourth, you have the historical reliability of the Gospels. You might say, well, we're going through a lot of just random stuff tonight because it's important. Because the Gospels are things that we can trust. And if you ever listen to an atheist or talk with one, which, by the way, some of your own grandchildren might be atheists someday, you need to know how to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. Because if you can't defend why the Gospels are true, then why do you even believe? Because your belief is based on what someone else has said. So you should be able to what? Articulate why these things are true. So why are they historically reliable? Well, first, we need to acknowledge that sometimes the Gospels place things in different order. Right? This doesn't compromise their credibility. They have theological reasons as to why they choose the order they do. For example, like I've said, Matthew does his things in a certain order to convey that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Luke does things in a chronological order. Sometimes the very events aren't mentioned in the same order. For example, is anyone with Jesus when he's in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights? No. So guess what? Matthew and Luke will actually switch the order of two of the events. Does that mean that they're somehow now not authentic? No, when those men talk, they're just saying Jesus was faced with these three temptations when he was in the wilderness. Does the order actually matter? Not particularly. 
Uh, they both get the first one the same. They both have the, right, the loaves turn, or the stones turn into loaves. That's the same temptation for both of them. That's the first one. But the second one and third one are flipped. One has Jesus on a mountain as the second one. One has Jesus at the uh, pinnacle of the temple as the second one, right? Because the mountains where Satan says, bow down to me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. The pinnacle of the temples where Satan quotes scripture and says, right, he'll give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against the stone, right? So he says, right, throw yourself off. They flip those. Does that mean that the Gospels are wrong? No. It just means that they are, again, emphasizing things when they're emphasizing things. Again, by the way, again, an event when the only person that was there is Jesus. So when Jesus comes back, again, he probably tells his disciples when they say, where were you for the past 40 days? I was in the wilderness, and Satan was out there, and he was tempting me. Again, they're probably hearing the account from Jesus. By the way, Luke tends to do things in order. So I tend to think Luke's is in order on purpose. I tend to think Matthew's has a theological reason as to why he chooses the order he does. Does that make sense? None of our faith is shaken right now, right? That the fact that two events happen to be in a different order. Again, understand there's purposes as to why you choose the order. It's not always chronological. Again, they don't write history like we write history. We write history because... Again, history is really a modern phenomenon in the way that we do it. In the way that we write history is really just the past maybe 150 years, maybe 200 years. The way we write history is very new. The way other people wrote history was not to be chronological. It was to emphasize something. So again, understand, you cannot make them fit into your little circle hole of what you think history is because they're going in a square box and you're trying to make it fit in a circle. Okay, they wrote history differently. That doesn't mean it's not historical. Okay, it's still historical. It's just, again, we can't take what we think is history today and superimpose it on them and say, well, they're wrong because they don't do it like we do it. You see how stupid that is? How do we know the way that we write history is the right way to write history? Yes, you said it's not. You're right. Since the 50s, it's really bad. You know why? Because we rewrite history, right, based on critical theory, right? That's not the way it really happened. It really happened because white people are bad. Or that's history today. That's why it's called critical race theory. Critical theory bred critical race theory. So we write history to make it seem like anyone who's in authority is evil. And that's how all history is written today. Anyone that's in authority is evil, and they're an oppressor on those that are a minority. Is that the right way to write history? No. But modern historians will take what they write as history and say, oh, the Gospels don't meet our standards. Well, how do you know, again, the way that your writing is the right way to write? Again, by the way, if everything is subjective in our culture, they shouldn't have any problem with the Gospels and the way they write. Because that's just the way, that was their truth. That's the way they did it. But in all reality, anyone who writes actually writes for a purpose. If you're not writing for a purpose, you have no purpose, and maybe you shouldn't be writing. By the way, those that write critical race theory and critical theory and history, they have a purpose too. You know what their purpose is? to make anything in authority seem evil, to destroy everything. That's their purpose. And again, when you used to read History Books of America, what was their purpose? To make you feel patriotic. Which, by the way, we can all agree that sometimes they would gloss over maybe some bad things that we did to make everyone patriotic. Why? Because everyone that writes history has a reason as to why they write. And the gospel writers are no different. The difference is they're not lying. You know why? Because they say all the bad things about themselves. They point out all their own failures. Mark, who's the disciple of Peter, mentions that Peter denied the Lord. Which means what? It's true history. If it wasn't true history, you wouldn't announce your failures. You would only announce your successes. But they announced their failures, and they announced Jesus' successes. Why? Because Jesus never failed. It's a true history. So again, you'll have different orders. Concerning the words of Jesus, you have to remember this. What language did Jesus speak in? Aramaic or Hebrew? There's some debate over the two. By the way, they're both basically identical. There's really not much of a difference. So I don't understand why there's much of a debate anyways, because honestly, nobody really knows. I tend to think that he probably spoke in Hebrew, and the reason is, is that in Luke, he records that what was written over Jesus' head was in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew which means I tend to think that Hebrew was the common language they actually spoke. I think there's enough defense for that. Um, 
but modern scholars are the ones that kind of came up with the Aramaic thing. Now, Aramaic was a trade language at the time, but is a trade language how you always talk? No. For example, if you go to a Mexican today in America, English is a trade language for them. They speak Mexican. So guess what they speak in their homes? Mexican. Guess what they speak in public when they're talking to you? Sometimes Mexican, but usually English, right? <laughs> Why? Because English is their trade language. Right? They're just using it to barter with you and to, to do business with you. But that's not their main language. Again, Aramaic was a trade language because there's other Semitic languages in the area. You have other Arabian tribes and nations from Ishmael and others that all speak those Semitic languages. So it was a trade language amongst the Semitic nations. Greek was a trade language amongst basically the Roman Empire. And Latin was the official language of the Roman Empire, even though basically none of them spoke it. It was mostly for the Roman soldiers. So again, since it says Hebrew, I tend to think everyone that's walking by probably speaks Hebrew as their primary language. So again, if that's the case and Jesus speaks everything in Hebrew, guess what our New Testament's written in? It's written in Greek. So what does that mean? If Jesus spoke in Hebrew and you have to say it in Greek, what did you just have to do to get it into Greek? You had to translate what he said. You know when you translate something, there's different ways to translate it, and it's still saying the same thing? If you're confused by that, uh, go pull out a text comparison of just a translation of one verse in the Bible and see how many different ways there are to say one thing. I'm not talking about textual variants, okay? I'm talking about just how you can say something from another language into one language. And you'll find 30 different ways to say the exact same thing. Does that mean the text behind is different, by the way? And I'm talking about cases where it's not different, okay? I understand sometimes with modern translations, there's differences sometimes. I'm talking about cases where there's no difference. When there is no difference, guess what? You'll still find them saying the same thing different ways. You know why? Because there's a lot of ways to say the same thing. So guess what? You have Jesus speaking in Hebrew, them saying it in Greek, and then we're like, they said it differently. You realize they're all saying the same thing. They're just saying it in slightly different ways. Why? Because they're translating what he said from Hebrew into Greek. So guess what? It's not an argument. But you'll find a bunch of unlearned people who have their English degrees and who want to study the Bible as English literature, which it's not. And will do what? They'll say there's differences in what Jesus said. Anyone with enough brain power to understand that when you translate something, it translates differently should know we should expect slight differences. Why? Because they're translating what Jesus said in Hebrew into Greek. And then we're translating what he said in the Greek into English. So then you have another difference. So it shouldn't be surprising that it sounds slightly different even though it's the same thing. Does that make sense? Now you can all feel better when an atheist tries to use that argument against you. Because guess what? They do try to use that argument against Christians and say, he said this here and this here. Guess what? He's saying the same thing. It's just how the gospel writers recorded it. Ultimately, the differences in accounts show that these are distinct eyewitness accounts and it gives credibility to the witness. Why? Because if they all said the exact same thing, you know what that means? Just even from a forensic standpoint? You've collaborated and you lied. If, if we all were on trial right now together, let's say you were all on trial against me and I wanted you to get you on my side and try to give you all a story of events and I gave you all a piece of paper that said, make sure you say this. And you all stood on the stand and you all said the exact same thing. Every single attorney and judge and jury will be told they've collaborated. We cannot accept their testimony. It's a lie. So guess what? Differences actually adds credibility to witness, which is ironic that people who have degrees today are so stupid they can't realize that. And maybe I shouldn't be so mean. I got to read a lot of stupid stuff sometimes, and it just shocks me what people say and why they say it. And it's like, what about this? What about that? Didn't you think through this or think through that? By the way, that happens everywhere. You know, we all need to do a better job of thinking through things sometimes. But understand the Gospels are something you can trust. So next week, we'll go through kind of the second part of this, which is, okay, here's setting and narrative and the things that the Gospels do, the things to focus on uh, as we read through them. Again, uh, when you see characters and things about them are mentioned, those are things to notice. Uh, for example, Judas has mentioned having the bag, but Judas is also mentioned when, right when the ointment's broken and anointed on Jesus, 
Why was he upset? Because he was a thief, and that was worth a lot of money. It says it, and I think in the Gospel of John, John's not ashamed about who Judas is. John was loved by Jesus. Uh, Judas was the son of perdition. John has a lot of things to say about the son of perdition. So he'll say things like, right, oh, he was a thief from the beginning. He did this or that, because he'll add those details to know why was he so upset. He was upset because he wanted that to be sold so he can steal from it. Because he didn't actually give to the poor. He was a thief. So again, all those details are important. Those are things to pick up on. Again, read the narratives as stories. I don't mean stories as in they're not real, but notice details. Again, they're telling a story. It's meant to create suspense. It's meant to give details that you're supposed to pick up on later and say, oh, I remember reading that before. Wow, I can't believe it came up again. You guys do that when you read normal books, don't you? And you're always impressed by authors who notice the details at the beginning and somehow find a way to bring them up again. You're like, wow, this is great writing. And then we read the Gospels and we're like, oh, it's just the Bible. As if these guys aren't good writers. You realize how difficult it is to actually think through how you tell something and to bring up details from before, later, and plan on that? Especially when every word that you say matters because you can't just like scratch it out back then because of how expensive it was. You actually had to think through these things ahead of time. And then what? Then when you wrote it out, that was it. So again, these things are important. The details are there and are important. And by the way, they give theological significance. They're things for you to apply to yourselves. Like again, we mentioned Joseph earlier, right? Joseph's a just man. So what does he do when he has to deal with some sin that he thinks is sin? He does it privately. He does it quietly. So no one else has to know. Here's what's ironic with Christians, because we're really not as righteous as we think we are. When someone else has an issue, you know what we do? We go to every single other person to complain. I can't believe they did this. I can't believe they did that. Instead of what? Go to them privately, deal with it, never bring it up again. Why? Because that's what a righteous person does. You don't have to embarrass others for you to be right. You know what a righteous person does? They deal with issues quietly, and they move on. An unrighteous person has a big mouth. By the way, if you look at Proverbs, everyone with a big mouth is a fool. Everyone who talks a lot is a fool. Me included. Those that have to make their heart known, the Bible says, is a fool. If all you have to do is speak your feelings and your thoughts on something, that's foolish. You know why? You should think through your thoughts and feelings before you speak them. Because really, you don't have to divulge everything to everyone. You should have enough discretion to what? Protect someone else's reputation. Because that's what a righteous person does. A righteous person should never want someone else to be thought ill of. We're going to speak about that on Sunday. Because we're going to talk about Christian love. Because it's Romans 12. And that'll all, no one will be here for it. Um, whenever we talk about things in church that are actually important, no one shows up. You know why? Uh, one, I think Satan doesn't want us there, so Satan will bring obstacles, and we as Christians are so soft today. Whenever an obstacle comes up, we say, okay, whatever, I'm not going to go. So one, we're kind of soft. Because when I was growing up, it's you don't call and you crawl in, and so we drive through feet of snow to go to church. And that happened before, and our pastor didn't let us know that church was canceled. My dad led music. We lived 20 miles away from church. There was literally about eight inches of snow on the ground. We drove for an hour and a half to church. We get there, there's a sign on the door that says, church is canceled today. And we left two hours early because we knew that it was going to snow and it was going to take us a while to get there. And we graciously went home and didn't say a word. <laughs> My dad did tell me the past. He's like, the next time, could you just call us? You know, if you're going to have plans, just call us before we leave. But that was before cell phones. You couldn't just, if we, did, if we left the house, that was it. You know, we left the house. So we would wait until we knew we had to leave the house. When you left the house, that was it. Too bad. I live over cell phones. I know. It's unbelievable. I'm, I'm, I'm like semi-old. Um, so Christians make excuses for all sorts of things nowadays. But inevitably, too, when we need to hear something, uh, again, like I said, the devil usually fights against it. And two, we often don't want to listen to it either because we don't like to hear things that we're wrong about. And Christian love is something that all Christians are wrong about. You know why? Because most Christians are too negative towards others. And true Christian love is not that way. True Christian love is very compassionate, it's very giving, and it's very forgetful in the sense that it never holds things against others ever. Even when it's happened to you, you just let it go and move on with life. So by the way, be here Sunday so you can feel bad and hopefully change 
because Satan's going to give you a lot of excuses. And when you have other people that give you excuses for Sunday that you guys know that you kind of trot along to church, tell them to come anyways. Because Christian love is the one thing that Jesus says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love, love one toward another. That's my Sunday. I don't know how I ended this with that, but that's we're going through Sunday. Oh, because we're talking about Joseph. Yeah. So historical narrative's good. Focus on those details, because those are things to draw from for yourself, whether positive or negative. The negative thing about Judas is what? Don't make everything spiritual, because maybe you're a thief. Right? Oh, we could have used that money for something else. Guess what? Jesus said that was used exactly for what it should be used for. Don't be so spiritual that you can't use stuff for the best thing because you want to use it for what you want, which for Judas was to kind of steal it. But that happens in churches too, right? I don't want to spend money on that. I have my little pet thing over here. Guess what? It shouldn't matter. Spend it on the best thing, not on what you want. So you see what other character things that you realize, I shouldn't behave this way either. So you see how that works? There are things to draw. There are things to conclude. There are things to ponder, things to meditate on. And then, of course, the best thing to meditate on is the Lord Jesus. What does he do? What does he say? And the acts that he does should give me trust that I can listen to what he says and do what he says. All right.